Welcome everyone to our Boys Will Be Boys expert interview series. I'm Dr. Caroline Heldman and I'm an advisor to the Representation Project. If you're not familiar with our work, uh, this organization was founded by the award-winning filmmaker Jennifer Siebel Newsom more than a decade ago uh, with the idea that films and storytelling could challenge and shift harmful gender norms and stereotypes. Um, this interview series is really our love letter to boys and men. Uh, it's a way of really kind of releasing the chains, if you will, of restrictive masculinity. And the idea is that boys will be boys means that they can be anything and everything that they want to be without the constraints of traditional masculinity. Um, I am delighted today to be sitting down with Dr. Robert Jensen. Um, he has been doing really important work around healthy masculinity for multiple decades. Uh, let me read you his bio and then we'll jump right into this interview. Uh, Bob Jensen is an emeritus professor in the School of Journalism at the University of Texas at Austin and collaborates with the, the New Perennials Project at Middlebury College. Uh, his latest book is It's Debatable, talking authentically about tricky topics. I have read the book. I highly recommend it. So hop on out there if you want to know how to talk about tricky culture war topics, especially across the political aisle. Um, Bob is the co-author with Wes Jackson of An Inconvenient Apocalypse, Environmental Collapse, Climate Crisis, and the Fate of Humanity. He is also the author of The Restless and the Restless Mind of Wes Jackson, Searching for Sustainability. Um, Bob has written about 12 books, maybe more depending upon how you count it, but they include The End of Patriarchy, Radical Feminism for Men, uh, Plain Radical, Living, Loving, and Learning to Leave the Planet Gracefully. Also a book, Arguing for Our Lives, A User's Guide to Constructive Dialogue. Uh, All My Bones Shake, Seeing a Progressive Path to the Prophetic Voice, um, Getting Off, Pornography and the End of Masculinity, which is going to focus heavily in our conversation today. Uh, Bob has also written a book called The Heart of Whiteness, Confronting Race, Racism, and White Privilege, uh, Citizens of the Empire, The Struggle to Claim Our Humanity, and Writing Dissent, Talking, um, sorry, Taking Radical Ideas from the Margins to the Mainstream. Um, Dr. Jensen is also co-producer of the documentary film Abe Osaroff, One Foot in the Grave and the Other Still Dancing, through the Media Education Foundation, which chronicles the life and philosophy of a longtime radical activist, which is what Bob is. Welcome, Dr. Jensen. Oh, well, it's good to be here. I am long time. I'm getting old enough that I fit in that category, but it's great to talk with you, Caroline. Likewise, a long admirer of your work. Um, many times you are pushing the envelope and you are saying things that a lot of other folks are afraid to say. Um, you're obviously far on the left and there's sometimes an illib illiberal strain on the left that uh, doesn't want to hear certain ideas and you're someone who is pushing for that. So let's jump right in. Tell us about mm -hmm your upbringing, your path to research and radical activism around masculinities and gender equity. Um, how did you get on this path? What is your story? Well, I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota, a small Midwestern city uh, in the 1960s and 70s. I was short, skinny, and effeminate, which meant I had a target on my back. Uh, so as a kid, um, I knew I, kn I didn't fit in. I, I knew I didn't have what it took to be a man in, in that sense. Um, as I grew up, uh, I tried to fit into that conventional masculinity once I was in my 20s. And I wasn't very good at it. And I was a pretty miserable person. So when I hit 30 years old, I went back to graduate school, was fortunate enough to study, discovered the radical feminist critique of pornography and feminism more generally, and I realized that feminism explained a lot of my struggles, a lot of my pain and suffering. Uh, so in addition to being an incredibly insightful analysis of why women and girls suffer in the way they do in male dominant societies, feminism also opened up a door for me to understand my own life. And, and that's why I've been saying as often as possible that radical feminism is not a threat to men which is how it's usually presented to us. In fact, it's a gift to us. It's a way for us to understand ourselves better and transcend those conventional norms of masculinity to the degree that's possible. Mm. So 
feminism, Andrea Dworkin and Catherine yeah. McKinnon and other radical feminists were describing or explaining what you had gone through. Yeah, and, very much so. And, and you know, you, you made a point in the introduction of how this is um, a project to help boys. And I, I always want to explain to people that there are two great myth myths about feminism, especially this radical feminism. One is that feminists have no sense of humor, which is not true. <laughs> I've had some of the greatest laughs of my life with um, feminist colleagues. But the other is that feminists, especially radical feminists, somehow hate men. And um, when I became part of the anti-pornography movement, when I got to know people in feminism, I can't think of a single time I ever felt hated. I, I, it was clear that the women who who generated these ideas and, and led this movement had a love of humanity. And I always felt a kind of warmth in feminist circles. It doesn't mean women in the feminist movement weren't willing to hold me accountable. And they, they do and they still they have and they still do because like anyone else, I make mistakes. But uh, the, the, the idea that feminism is somehow out to get men is really a myth in my experience. Absolutely. I mean, you just bring up, a, 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 feminists were initially talking about violence against boys and men. They were perhaps the first folks talking about that and really taking it seriously. Um, and you also are situating yourself as a radical feminist. And I know this isn't part of our kind of pre-planned questions, but there are different types of feminism, yeah. right? I've, I've written about 10 different types, although I don't think that even captures it. Can you just speak briefly? So radical feminism, what does that mean? And what is what is yeah. the dominant type of feminism? Because radical isn't it. Yeah, feminism has, like any movement, uh, grown and, and different ideas have emerged and gone by the wayside or, or been, um, pushed forward. So right now, I think you can really talk in the United States about radical feminism and a kind of liberal or sometimes postmodern feminism. Radical feminism, like most radical movements, goes to the heart of a system and tries to understand how the problems people uh, stumble uh, into are the product of a system, not just of individual failings. Uh, I think liberal feminism tends to be a little less um, I think, uh, trying to find the right word, a little less willing, we'll leave it neutral, to push at the deep structures of male dominance in a system we call patriarchy. The, the issue that really has defined radical versus liberal for a long time was the pornography issue. So the radical feminist critique of pornography saw pornography as part of a way that men routinely buy and sell objectified female bodies in a patriarchal society. Whereas liberal feminism try, usually frames it as a matter of individual choice of sexual expression, and I think misses the nature of the system in which women are used and abused by men sexually. So um, the, the radical feminist movement uh, isn't afraid to go at some of the core practices in contemporary society, one of which is the way men buy and sell women's bodies, whether it's in prostitution on the street, massage parlors, strip bars, pornography. Uh, those are all important practices for feminism to critique from my perspective. Well, that is a great segue into the next question. Um, back in more than a decade ago, I think it was 2007, um, you came to campus and talked about um, porn. And you posed the question of, given that porn is becoming more degrading and more violent at the same time it's becoming more widely available you ask the question of what comes next meaning mm -hmm. um that porn was ramping up um its violence and degradation and you wondered where it would end or what it would look like mm -hmm. and so jump ahead um yeah. liberal feminists have have by and large um own the debate meaning we don't really have a public conversation mm -hmm. about the harms of pornography to boys and girls uh, men and women um and peggy ornstein's been publishing a lot of data recently, hard data on the effects of violent pornography and its kind of normalization. Uh, she finds that uh, in, in nationally representative surveys that 25% of heterosexual women are afraid to have sex with men because of surprise strangulation, which is battery, and surprise anal sex, which is rape. Um, and that nonviolent sex is no longer the norm. The norm is now violent sex. And nonviolent sex is now other, right, derisively, derisively called vanilla sex. So sex equals violence and vanilla sex 
it equals no violence. So it's completely kind of shifted that. Um, and you have written about and talked about the paradox of pornography, right? That pornography is becoming more cruel and degrading and more racist than ever before, but it's being given even more of a pass now by leftists or some folks on the left. Um, yeah. Where's the question? Can you talk to us about yeah. you know, where it, where porn has gone? Let's start. You mentioned Andrea Dworkin, who's one of the most important figures in articulating this feminist critique of what I call the domination subordination dynamic that's in porn, because porn is not just sex on film. As Andrea and other women back in the 60s and 70s indicated, pornography is sex in the context of domination and subordination, the primary dynamic being male domination, female subordination. And, you know, we lost we lost Andrea almost 20 years ago now, and uh, it's a real loss to the culture. I, you know, she was very important. I, I'll digress briefly, very important in helping me come to see this with the power of her analysis and the passion of her language. Um, and she was uh, analyzing pornography from the 1970s that compared to today looks very tame. But Andrea was brilliant in being able to see that domination uh, dynamic in pornography. And it's only gotten more intense, as you point out, in the succeeding decades, which, a quick footnote, kind of means that Andrea was right. Those those women who early on saw that were very perceptive. And it's especially sad that their, their insights have been largely ignored in the dominant culture. Okay, so back to your question. Um, this intensification of the cruelty and degradation as well as the racism in porn is self-evident. Uh, everybody agrees, even pornography's defenders will acknowledge that this has happened. Uh, why is that? Well, uh, you know, pornography has expanded dramatically as legal constraints and cultural constraints have gone away. And so they have to con continue to create new markets. Right? And so how do you do that? In pornography, you do that by intensifying the domination. And as you pointed out, it's gotten into um, acts that are really overtly violent. Uh, strangling women during sex in pornography is now routine. Multiple penetrations, where more than one man penetrate a woman at the same time, uh, are routine. Uh, all of this is just the, the usual. And when I was doing research on the industry back in the 2000s to, to write that book, uh, already I was asking porn producers and directors, where's the next trend? What are you going to do next? And they all said the same thing. We don't know. I'll never forget one porn director said, I've done everything to a woman's body I know how to do. I don't know what's next. And of course, the only place to go was more overt violence. The other thing that's very important is the early anti-pornography anti feminists said, this is going to help shape men's attitudes as consumption of porn becomes routine. And that's going to lead to changed behaviors. And we now see evidence all over the place that that's true, including the presence of sexual practices that are common in pornography, typically not that common in the world, in the real world, that have now become more routine. Uh, and, and women, to a large degree in my experience, uh, often say, and I certainly had a number of students tell me this over the years, I would love to be able to date men who don't use pornography. I'd love to get out of this pornographic trap. But they say, we don't know any men who don't use porn. Yeah. And so uh, men are trapped when they their sexual imaginations are conditioned to this kind of aggressive and sometimes violent sexuality. And women, heterosexual women, are trapped when they don't see any other options. And it's, it is a majority, right? It's about two thirds of men who are yeah. regularly using porn and about one third of women yeah. who are yeah. now regularly yeah. using porn who are getting that same script. And yeah, I, I started to hear from my students about yeah. a decade ago that they, my heterosexual women students were saying, we're afraid of sex. And at first I was like, what do you mean? Like, because it's awkward or because I teach classes on sexuality as do you. And it was just surprising to me how quickly, you know, what was happening in porn became normalized. So, you know, the going from zero to about 60% for anal sex um, and about, you know, zero to 30% for, 
for regular routine strangulation and Peggy Ornstein's data is mm. really shocking. The new um, data that's come out in the last yeah. month or so on the uh, w that young women in their 20s um, who have engaged in multiple acts, you know, who routinely engage in strangulation during sex, um, now have you can measure their cognitive deficiencies. That it, yeah. you know, there's no safe way to choke. As much as yeah. there are safer ways, there's no safe way, right? The whole point is that you're, yeah. you're cutting off oxygen to the brain. Yeah, you know, I think um, I'm going to say it's really important that someone like you is talking about this. Uh, you know, I'm an, a rapidly aging old guy. You're cool, and. Wow. And the reason I mention that is young women, I think, need role models of women who re reject and resist the pornographic culture as you do. L let me give you an example of this. I was talking to a, a female student in my office and she was inquiring about my work on pornography and I was explaining it to her. And she said, you know, this is really a generational thing. She said, you older people care about this, but we're, you know, my generation, she said, including all my girlfriends, you know, we're cool with porn. And I said, okay, let me give you a hypothetical. There are two men that you're interested in dating and on every aspect of what's attractive, you know, how they look, how funny they are, smart, whatever it is that you find attractive. I said, they're roughly equivalent. And the only meaningful difference between the two of them is that one habitually masturbates to pornography and the other one doesn't use pornography at all. I said, which one would you want to date? And she kind of said, well, the guy who doesn't use porn. And I said, wait, you just told me porn's okay. Everybody does it. It's no big deal. I said, why would you prefer the guy who doesn't use porn? And she was kind of stuck for an answer because as a, a younger person, she'd been uh, socialized into saying pornography didn't bother her. But when confronted with that question, she realized it did. And, and she had to work that out for herself. So I think it's really important for all of us to talk about how we do not want to be part of that pornographic culture. Not only do we not want to use pornography, we don't want our own sexual imaginations tied to movies made by somebody just trying to make a buck. Uh, but we also resist a pornographic culture more generally, right? The way that women are routinely objectified as sexual objects, not just in pornography, but in mainstream culture. You know, the representation project has led the way on this, obviously. So. I really feel that even though uh, sometimes people say it's not cool to critique porn, uh, I, we need a movement where the cool, it becomes cool to critique porn, that's it. That's what the cool kids are doing now. Well, and, and for their own mental and sexual health, yeah, right? So we've yeah. talked a lot about the harms to, to girls and women. Yeah. Um, can you talk to us sure. about the harms to boys and men? Yeah, uh, I remember when I first started doing public talks about pornography, Often there'd be one guy, he'd, he'd wait around till all the people had talked to me. And then he would come over and say, I would love to quit using porn, but I feel addicted to it. And he said, I can tell how it's warping me. Uh, I, I remember the first time a young man said to me, I can't have sex with my girlfriend without playing out a porn movie in my head. And he knew with, with no analysis, no data, <laughs> no theory, he knew this was bad for him. And that's only accelerated with the internet and the ease with which men, and again, it's primarily men using pornography, the way that men can use pornography for sexual arousal during masturbation. Uh, there's actually now a term, porn-induced erectile dysfunction, that describes typically young and healthy young men who have no markers for erectile dysfunction physiologically. They have no physical problem, but their habitual use of pornography in this kind of addictive like fashion has made it impossible for them to function sexually at all. And there are support groups online for these kind of folks. And so, you know, men are seeing that the, the pornographic cornucopia is, is no treat. Uh, it undermines their own sense of self, their own ability to, to function as sexual beings in the world. And I think increasingly with all this aggressive and sometimes violent pornography, I think men also intuitively know it's undermining their own ability to be decent human beings. Because everybody knows if your sexual arousal is tied to the degradation of a woman, to cruelty against women, to aggressive actions against women, 
if your sexuality is tied to that, you're not going to be able to live as a fully decent person in the world. You have a quote in, in getting off your book um, where you say that not all orgasms are good, yeah. right? You talk about pedophilia, mm -hmm. you talk about violence against women, and um, you know a lot about the porn industry and how it operates, right? And the, yeah. the model of addiction and capitalism yeah. that drive it. Yeah. Um, can you speak a little more to that? How yeah. we our yeah. sexual imaginations sure. have been hijacked by capitalists? Sure. Let, let me just talk about myself because... I, I always want to make it clear I'm not preaching from on high, you know, I'm not a saintly feminist man who lives uh, without sin. <laughs> uh, but I think about my own life as a, a boy and a young man before I engage the feminist critique. Uh, I use pornography and use it in the kind of habitual cyclical way that a lot of young men do. This is all before the Internet, but, uh, you know, I would be drawn to pornographic images. Uh, they were arousing. I always say, you know, we, we at least have to recognize pornography works. It's very good at producing sexual arousal quickly in male consumers. Uh, but there was always a cycle that I would use porn and then feel um, sometimes a sense of shame, but even not always shame, just a sense of unease that I knew this wasn't a healthy way for me to, de to be developing sexually. Uh, and so I was trapped in that same cycle that so many young men are, where they use it and then feel that crash afterward. Uh, and it was only through reading and then finally engaging with the feminist critique uh, through activism that I was able to see how, yes, the main problem of pornography is the way that the women in the industry are physically and psychologically damaged by it the way that women who are partnered with men who use pornography and engage in this kind of aggressive and violent sex suffer. So we always want to keep the suffering of women and girls central because that's the insight of feminism. But we also have to understand that when men can transcend what's sometimes called the man box, the pornographic trap, whatever you want to call it, our own lives get better. Now, I want to make it clear, it doesn't mean our lives are easy. Right? Engaging feminism didn't magically make my life easy. Um, it, like all of life, is painful at times. But if you ask me, do, would I ever want to go back to the person I was before I, I found radical feminism? Uh, there's no way that, that even the attempt to transcend those conventional norms of masculinity lead to, I think, a much deeper, richer, more meaningful life and, and much more fulfilling relationships, not just with women, but with with other men, my friendships with men are far deeper today than they could have ever been before I engaged feminism. Mm. And can you speak a bit more about that, about um, how feminism has deepened those relationships? Yeah. Well, of course, there's a lot of, you know, macho posturing in male friendship. I was never very good at it. I wasn't the big tough guy, you know, uh, but I tried to do it the way men typically try to do it. And at the time, let's say in my 20s, I couldn't have articulated why I was unhappy with those friendships. But now looking back, I can see that they they never got past a certain superficial level. And and today, the male friends I have, not all of whom are engaged in feminism, but the, the male friends I have, uh, I, I feel much more connected to. Just to give you an example, uh, two other men who I met through this movement Every two weeks, we have a, a Zoom call. We all live in different cities and we're all getting older and we're sharing our concerns about aging, about health, you know, about everything that comes. And, uh, you know, every two weeks for 90 minutes, I have a connection to these two guys that I couldn't have imagined when I was young. And it it's um, an unexpected reward of engaging with feminism. I think when I first started, working in feminism, I thought, well, this is what this is the right thing to do. Men should support women. And I agree that is true. But I really couldn't have predicted the the benefits to my own life. And and these deeper relationships with both men and women is just one example.
Well, let's give some advice to young men or to teachers who are you're working with boys. Yeah. Both, what what are the first steps to getting on the path to radical feminism if they want to go that route? And then, what are the first steps in you know getting out of the yeah. pornography culture? Yeah. First of all, I would say that uh, not everybody is comfortable saying I am a radical feminist or I'm a man affiliated with the radical feminist movement, and that's fine. I I worry less about labels the older I get. But I think what is important is if I were talking to young men, I would say, listen, I know you're afraid uh, because everybody's afraid. The question is getting clear about what to be afraid of. Right? So, you know, when I go back to when I was in my 20s, I was afraid of feminism. I thought feminists were going to take something away from me. I saw feminism as kind of the enemy because that's how I had been told to, to approach it. But then I realized, no, I should be afraid, but I should be afraid of masculinity, all these traditional norms that don't feel right to me, um, the aggression that these norms lead men into, whether it's you know physical fighting or you know vying for domination in the workplace, all of these things that are associated with what I would call patriarchal masculinity, conventional masculinity, toxic masculinity, call it what you like, uh, these always put me in opposition to other men and even men I would be friends with. You always had to watch out. I've often called this king of the hill masculinity. King of the hill is a game where, you know, you, you get up to the top of the hill and you defend from everyone else. And that's really what masculinity is like. You're always defending your position. Either you're dominant and you're, you know, repelling challenges to your dominance or you're subordinate and you're trying to gain dominance and it's just no way to live. That's what we should be afraid of. I'm not afraid of women and feminism anymore. Uh, I recognize that they offer me that path out of that dominance game because in dominance games, it might feel like you win. You get short term material benefits. You know, you make a lot of money. You have a lot of girlfriends. You do this, you do that. But in the end, everyone knows those aren't the things that produce a meaningful life. They aren't the things that produce a happy and healthy life. And so uh, be clear about what we're, we should be afraid of, I think is my advice. Mm. And who should they be reading? Well, I think, uh, you know, first there's always the work of women that is important to read. I'm so glad I started by reading women, not men in the feminist movement. Uh, I like to go back to some of those classics. I think Andrea Dworkin's, if I could recommend one feminist book, it would be Andrea Dworkin's Letters from a War Zone, which is a collection of speeches and essays published in the late 1980s, which um, really turned my life upside down. It was this probably the single most important book I've ever read in my life. Uh, but Andrea's work is now, you know, older and uh, reading more contemporary feminists. I, I have a friend who's a feminist philosopher named Rebecca Wisnant, who writes beautifully uh, with the, the the clarity of a philosopher, but the the passion of a feminist. Uh, you know, there's a lot of material online that I don't pretend to keep up with uh, uh, being an old guy. Uh, so uh, I think uh, there's, a, there's a great feminist press in Australia called Spin Effects, which is probably the only truly radical feminist press left publishing in English that I know of. And they are continuing to put out uh, beautiful work, not only uh, nonfiction analytic books, but poetry and memoirs. And, and there's just a, a wonderful, rich variety in the spin effects catalog. I would encourage people to check them out. Okay, great and practical next steps. Um, you've been engaged in radical gender justice work for decades. Uh, tell us what's gotten better and what has gotten worse. Well, I think if you look at any of the key questions around social justice, whether it's racism and white supremacy, patriarchy and male uh, dominance, uh, capitalism and economic inequality, you can see great advances and setbacks, which I think is true of every movement. So, you know, just think of uh, the areas in which women now occupy public space that they didn't when I was a kid. The first woman to the US Supreme Court was uh, nominated the year I graduated from college, right? And there are now three women on the Supreme Court. 
that's a good thing. Uh, I'm glad for it. On the other hand, we've been talking about how the pornography industry has become more cruel and degrading to women with virtually no check on it from mainstream culture. That's a setback. Uh, abortion rights have gone forward and backward as we're well aware. So I think like any struggle to overcome centuries or millennia long systems of oppression, it's not a straight line. So are things better or worse today? Yes and no, no and yes. Uh, you just, I, I think if I've learned anything in now 40 years of working like this, it's that you find an issue uh, that for some reason is meaningful to you. Right? When I stumbled on the pornography issue in 1988, it spoke to me as a, a way to go forward and challenge a system I knew was oppressive. Uh, find what you know connects to your passion and do what you can in the place you can do it. Uh, we're not all positioned to do the same things. And so, um, you know, let a hundred flowers bloom and let people find a way to connect. Um, increasingly, I think local organizing, local activism is always a great place to start. Um, it, it can feel overwhelming to say, how do we change national policy? You know, how do you change international gender norms? Hard to imagine, but you can work in your own community, whether it's volunteering at a rape crisis center or starting a reading group around sexual violence. There's all sorts of things people can do. And there's a movement to just do a basic thing like requiring, you know, a 18 or older for pornography, yeah, yeah. which is, you know, just enforcing that law. So there, yeah. there are all sorts of, of Absolutely. ways people can get involved, as as you're noting. Um, if if you had a magic wand, what cultural mm -hmm. levers would you push? Uh, well, those are the kind of questions that any attempt to answer feels foolish. So, uh, <laughs> because it's such a huge thing. Obviously, there are religious traditions that embrace patriarchy. And religion, whether one is secular or religious oneself, religious traditions are powerful. So take Christianity, that's the tradition I come out of. There are liberal versions of Christianity that I think have uh, an approach to sex gender norms that is progressive. And then there are more regressive trends within sometimes the same denomination. Right? So I think we can't ignore the power of faith in how we come to understand ourselves as men and women. Uh, I think in political movements, um, the you know, as, as I said, I come out of the political left and from my point of view, the political left as a formation has never been very good on a deep commitment to challenging patriarchy. Uh, often left men especially retreat when you try to press them on their own behavior, for instance. And so I think if we're part of political movements, that's another lever to constantly make sure that whatever issue we're working on, whether it's economic justice or ecological concerns, to try and bring a, a feminist analysis into it, not only around gender questions, but around the bigger questions as well. Because to me, feminism is kind of the foundational liberation movement. Uh, men's domination of women, what we call patriarchy, goes back the furthest in human history, several thousand years. And, and I don't think we're gonna make much progress on any justice question if we don't hitch it to uh, a feminist analysis of, of male power. Noting. The, the original template, if you will, yeah, for yeah, systems of yeah. power and oppression. Um, uh, what would you say to your younger self right now? And this is our last question, so get your questions in the yeah. Q&A, but yeah. uh, what would you say to your younger self right now if you could talk with him? What advice or knowledge would you share, Bob? It's funny, I, I never know what's gonna hit me emotionally when I talk about this, but um, your mention of my younger self um, reminded me of how terrified I was as, as I said, a very small, skinny, effeminate man, a boy who was terrible at sports. <laughs> and in 1967 in Fargo, North Dakota, being small, skinny, effeminate and terrible at sports was tough. Okay. And uh, I assumed that that was my problem. I assumed that those were my failures. So I grew up with this sense that I was not man enough, but it was, it was something wrong with me. And if I could go back and talk to that kid, I would say, listen, you're fine. You're a little nerdy, you're a little bookish, 
yes, you're, you're not much on the basketball court, but there's more to life than that. And don't worry, because as you grow up, you'll find those other aspects of yourself, whether they fit traditional masculinity or not, won't matter so much. So I think I would go back to my, you know, eight year old self and say, it's going to be a rough ride, but you'll get through it. Uh, and whatever you do, don't blame yourself for it. Mm. And your life has been dedicated to making sure that other boys don't feel that way. Yeah. yeah. I, I, um, let's jump I can hope, I was going to say, because, um, you know, you asked about whether we've made progress or not. And sometimes on these questions, it can feel like we've really been pushed back. And so it was just a moment of reflection where, saying, where, where it's easy to think, gosh, have we had any effect at all? But I'm going to stay hopeful and say yes. <laughs> We, yes. we've, we've had effects and we need to keep going. Yes, we we have, right? Gender justice work has in the in the yeah. past 50 years. It just has. Yeah. Yeah. I think certain ways it's gotten much worse and pornography is maybe one of these ways, right? When, yeah. when it comes to the degradation, the compulsory degradation of women that we require of heterosexual men. And of course, the degradation of women in porn and how it plays out in real life. But no doubt, right? We're having conversations yeah. about sexual violence. We're having conversations about restrictive masculinity. Um, this is my my hopeful pep talk in the face of, you know, reproductive rights being overturned and such. I'm writing down that phrase, the compulsory degradation of women in heterosexuality. That's That describes so much of how boys are trained to see women. I'm, I'm going to borrow that one from you. Right. Well, I call it the great setup, right? We, hmm. we impart all of this to them and then yeah. for 18 years and then we're like, hey, and now you got to respect women. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's not yeah. how this software thing works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have some great questions here. Um, first question, Dr. Jensen, um, what is your take on feminist pornography? That's an issue that's been bumping around uh, for decades now. And I think there are a couple of things I would say. First of all, if women want to make sexually explicit images, um, I, I learned as a man, my job isn't to tell women what to do. <laughs> okay. Uh, but there are, are a few, I think, critical questions to ask. One is, if you look at what gets marketed in the porn industry as feminist pornography, often it's not that much different from mainstream porn. So how is it feminist is, is a question. And along with that is, how are the women being used in the production of feminist pornography being used? Those are all questions. I'm not saying there's one answer to the question, but it's something to ask. The other thing I would always say about any sexually explicit images is it's not just the image itself. It's a society in which men are being conditioned to use graphic sexually explicit material for arousal and sexual release, right? It's training the male imagination to uh, finding sexual pleasure uh, in a two-dimensional world. And I think that there are reasons to wonder if that's ever healthy. The reason I say that is because you know, uh, in my lifetime, um, I think what I've learned about sex uh, and intimacy is that it's most powerful when one is vulnerable, that the real intensity and joy of sexuality is when you make yourself vulnerable in front of another person. It doesn't matter if it's another man, woman, whatever, but it's in that interaction right, where you you let go and you you feel like you're safe. OK. Um, in, in some sense, I think sex is best understood as a form of a communication. It's a way we communicate with another person. It's a way we learn about ourselves. Uh, and I don't think that can happen with a movie. <laughs> now, you know, I don't, I'm not saying sex is, is one thing, you know, especially as we age, sex has different roles in our lives. When we're young and we're just exploring our bodies, sex is one thing. In the context of a lifelong partnership, it might be another thing. But to me, the most important role sexuality has played in my life is helping me get to that place where I can be vulnerable in front of another person. That's real intimacy. And you don't have that with a movie. So whether it's feminist porn or not, I think we should always be asking, why, why do we want the screen in our life so often? What is it about the safety, comparative safety of sex with an image? Because after all, uh, an, an image on a screen never asks you to be vulnerable. It never asks you to, to reflect. It never engages you. 
it just provides stimulation. And I think sex is more than stimulation uh, for most of us, at least. Well, and you, I use so much of your work that in my sex courses, um, because you don't have the corner on truth, right? You actually mm -hmm. pose questions. And one of the driving questions of my, my sex class on debates and sexuality is what is sex for? And there are lots of different things that might be yeah. for but you point out as you are now using slightly different language that you say, we think about sex as heat, yeah. but actually sex is light. Like it, shines a light on us, on our, you know, it, that we don't quite know what it's for. Yeah. But in that not knowing, that means yeah. we have to protect it and not let it become something that capitalists yeah. exploit. You know, I'm glad you reminded me of that. I'm old enough, I don't remember everything I've written. Uh, but this is a, another example of how it's not just pornography. So this obsession in the culture with hot, is she hot, is he hot? This immediate question of, of hotness, um, I think is really, degraded a lot of conversation uh, as as we meet and engage other people. You know, when the first question is, how hot is she? Um, you've kind of already lost the ability to see that person as a human being. And, it, it, you know, the rating system, uh, I don't think helps us deepen our connection to other people. Yeah, absolutely not. And also a quick follow up. Um, you made me think of what I always ask about a thing in the culture, um, whether, you know, in terms of whether it's feminist or not, whether it's feminist porn or anything else. Um, the first question I try to get my students to think about is, uh, would this exist? Would this thing exist mm -hmm. without patriarchy? And then if the yeah. answer is yes, would it look different? Yeah. And well, so, um, and yeah. I mean, you're touching upon that when you, when you're talking about feminist pornography and yeah. I don't know if porn would exist. I mean, this is a really big question, right? Because you're talking yeah. about the inherent objectification of other human beings, which makes yeah. them subhuman yeah. by, by default, by, yeah. you know, definition, yeah. it makes them subhuman. So can we, is porn inherently dehumanizing? Yeah. Let, another way I've said this over the years is that, you know, human beings make art. Uh, about the things that perplex us. You know, I always say that's why there's so many paintings about God, right? There's so much religious art. Why? Because, you know, religion, the divine conceptions of faith, they're, they're difficult to articulate in words. Right? Uh, often you're talking about feeling. And I think that's also why there's so much art about sex, because sex is this very powerful force in our life that we don't fully understand. So I think it's important to say that the feminist critique of pornography is not a critique of art or any sexual expression in art. It's a critique of the industrial product that is produced using the bodies of real women right, to produce objectified female bodies for male sexual pleasure. Uh, and so it's good to keep those things very clear. Yeah. And 52% of those bodies in the most popular porn content, women's bodies, require medical care after yeah. a porn shoot, which yeah. some of these, these stats are so shocking. Okay. A number of people are asking about AI and deep fakes. So Anonymous asks, how does the increase in deep fake yeah. imagery impact pornography culture? Another asks, are you worried for the future of porn with the onset of AI culture? Another asks, do you think AI can be used to generate porn that doesn't harm women in the making of it? And if so, will that cause more problems than it solves? Yeah. And I just want to quickly jump in to say, I was just at a, an event uh, where we focused over the weekend, where we focused a lot on AI and they were mm -hmm. saying, everyone's going to take a movie. They're going to take their favorite movie and, and put a spin yeah. on it, or they're going to create their own movies that fit them. And this will be all possible with AI. And I turned to the person next to me and said, there is going to be so much rape and sexual violence in these mm -hmm. self-crafted films because they will be a product of the person who is a product of the culture. Sure. But Adam, what are your thoughts on this, Bob? Well, in some ways we don't have to predict because of course, deep fakes and, and, uh, non-consensual use of images in sexualized media is happening all around us. Um, I, I would just simply go back and remind everybody that every communication technology that's been developed has been pornographized uh, or pornified, probably a more elegant uh, term, uh, and usually um, in ways that have been detrimental as we've been saying, not only to girls and women, but to the culture more generally. So whether it's photography or movies or the telephone, phone sex, uh, when home video recorders came into use, um, 
it dramatically expanded the porn market. There's been good work about how the porn industry has actually set some of the trends in the technology. And of course, the internet is, you know, the prime example. So if you have a male dominant patriarchal culture, it would be surprising if new communications technologies were not used for pornographic purposes. And I think as porn has become more normalized, right, in our lifetime, that is when I was young, using pornography was still considered a little unseemly. You didn't admit it, right? Today, kids admit it all the time. So pornography has become normalized in vast sectors of the culture. And with that, you can assume that the new communication technologies, AI, um, you know, much more technologically sophisticated image construction programs. Uh, I'm sorry to say, I don't see any other way it's going to play out. Yeah, we haven't seen the end of it, right? It, yeah. it will actually, it will actually get worse and create new appetites, even though it's not maybe physically harming women or children. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Katie and an anonymous person, I think, an educator maybe, and a parent are asking a very similar question. So mm -hmm. Anonymous asks, do mm -hmm. you have any advice for talking to my 18-year-old daughter and 20-year-old son about how to develop sexually in healthy ways? And Katie asks, how can we reprogram our boys and young men? What messages yeah. can we deliver at younger ages to counter the socially yeah. constructed masculinity they yeah. digest? Yeah. Well, thinking as a parent, the first thing I would say is to remember that kids watch what we do, not just what we say. That's a kind of prime directive of parenting. And that means especially fathers, male parents, need to recognize that their sons are watching what they do. So if you say to a kid, you know, no porn and no premarital sex, and then you're going off to the strip bar, um, mixed messages don't help. I think if I, if I could talk to um, young people, I would say the first thing to remind them is they don't have to be sexual right away. I think a lot of kids feel this pressure. They feel drawn into a highly sexualized culture and they feel like somehow they're abnormal if they're not sexually active. Um, I remember a young a, a boy who was in middle school once told me uh, when I asked about some of, these stuff, some of these things, he said, I just wanna be a kid as long as I can. And already he knew that this culture was drawing him in and he he wanted to resist it. He he knew he wasn't ready. And so, you know, the the psychological literature on on cognitive and emotional development in kids is pretty clear. Uh, if kids are being forced into sexual behavior too early, it usually doesn't wor work out very well. So reminding kids that they don't have to be sexual to be cool, to be, you know, part of normal culture is really important. And then, you know, there are some groups. Uh, one is called Culture Reframed, which is run by a, a good friend of mine, Gail Dines, who's done some of the most important feminist anti-pornography writing over the last few decades. They have a parents program. I don't really feel competent to, to tell parents how to do this, but Culture Reframed has programs that are available free online that walk you step by step through this kind of thing. Another friend of mine from a more religious point of view uh, has a group called Educate Empower, and she's done really great curriculum, both for kids and for parents struggling with this. So there are good online resources that didn't exist 20 years ago. And I'll recommend Raised on Porn for Parents, which is just yeah. an hour long film. I think it's available yeah. online. There are a number of good recent films that have yeah. really tackled it from a data perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. lots, lots of support out there now yeah. that just wasn't there even 10 years ago. Um, yeah. And maybe this stuff, this uh, overlaps a bit, uh, but James is asking, um, can you speak to modern authors who communicate the radical feminist perspective? I'm looking for things to share with students. Yeah. Uh, as I just mentioned, my friend Gail Dines um, has done some really good work, um, a book that, that came out about 10, 15 years ago now, we're, we're all getting so old, I can't remember some of the details here. But that book is called Pornland, and I think it's one of the best. There's a new book coming from the woman who led the movement to get rape videos off of Pornhub. Pornhub is the largest online porn platform, and uh, she's got a book called Takedown that will talk about how activism can go after 
in this case, the worst offenders, not not all of the porn industry, but the porn industry that was clearly allowing non-consensual uh, images to be placed, which meant that images of not only adult women, but of children being raped were available on Pornhub. And those are now those are now gone. So that's a great victory. Uh, and we need to be reminded that those victories are possible. Uh, and, and again, I would point, uh, Culture Reframed has a great resource list as well. Um, uh, I, I also do think going back to some of those foundational feminist books from the end of the 20th century can be really useful uh, because you see the power of that, that radical spirit that motivated this movement in the beginning. Yeah, and Lila Micklewaite's book yeah. Down, is just, yeah. it's so much a, a resurgence of that kind of radical activism from yeah. the 70s and 80s. And yeah. um, it was wild to read about how Pornhub was yeah. obviously just allowing anything to be uploaded, yeah. but then they had collaborations with yeah. super uploaders who were trafficking. They yeah. were they were trafficking. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, and sometimes boys, children. Yeah. yeah, and if I can throw one more thought in there. Lila comes out of a, a Christian background, a religious tradition. Uh, I come out of a secular background. Uh, you know, there have been times when uh, faith communities and the feminist movement have not always uh, been in sync and often still are not in sync. But I do think that when people come to this issue, whether they're motivated by um, a, a faith or they're motivated by a feminist analysis, as long as there are shared values, I think that's really important. And one of the things I've seen in the religious critique of pornography develop in the time I've been involved is uh, taking feminism much more seriously. I'm not saying they're the same movements, but a lot of the people who came out of a religious tradition in the past and opposed pornography, opposed it, quite frankly, from a very patriarchal point of view. But uh, the 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 anti-pornography movement rooted in the church communities is now led primarily by women in my experience and women who may not be feminist in every way i would you know articulate but are working with feminism and embracing the insights of a lot of the feminist analysis so uh, sometimes we get into this secular religious divide that can't be bridged and i think the porn movement is a good example of how, in fact, it can be bridged constructively without pretending there aren't differences underneath as well. Yeah, that's a great point. And and I'm on the same side as you, right? Hardcore mm -hmm. agnostic, not agnostic, uh, mm -hmm. agnostic beyond atheist, uh, if that's a thing. But uh, yeah, so many great critiques of the human mm -hmm. critiques mm -hmm. around pedophilia and, and pornography coming um, from some of these yeah. religious organizations and also a lot of former sex workers or prostitutes, right? And very mm -hmm. much centering, very much centering them in the conversation yeah. instead of impugning, uh, right? It, it's a critique of the systems, yeah. which yeah. I think is where the overlap comes in quite a bit. And not to jump in one more time, but that's a very important <laughs> point that a lot of times the feminist anti-pornography movement gets criticized because we we allegedly hate women in pornography and hate women who are prostituted. And nothing could be further from the truth. As you point out, a lot of women who came out of the sexual exploitation industries, that's the term I use for prostitution, pornography, stripping, uh, have in fact been leaders in the movement. The original feminist anti-pornography um, movement in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which put forth the first feminist ordinance, uh, was run by a woman who came out of prostitution and pornography. So from the beginning, this is a movement that's been animated by the insights of women who have been used and abused in these industries. Mm -hmm. Those are absolutely the leaders and scholars who are being mm -hmm. critical of it at this point. Um, James asks, I struggle, struggle to communicate the costs of pornography to mm -hmm. other men, the cost to us and our minds and relationships. Can you go deeper into that? So maybe uh, some strategies for convincing other men. Uh, I think one of the most powerful questions to ask a, a boy or a man who uses pornography for sexual arousal is to say in the minute after your orgasm, you know, that immediate moment, how do you feel? Right, just a simple question. How do you feel in that moment? And I think uh, when you get past the, the, jo the jockeying and the bravado, a lot of men will say, uh, I don't feel good. You know, I feel empty. That's probably the word I've heard most is 
I feel kind of empty. There's all this buildup, all of this intensity. And again, remember, this, a pornographic movie you're watching online is intense, right? It's, it's much more intense than real life sexual experiences because it's all concentrated and edited, right? And so it's not hard to, to see how it's so effective at producing that arousal. But what about that, that moment after? And I think that's one of the most important questions to ask men and boys is, how do you feel? Forget all the BS. How do you really feel? Uh, and I, I rarely have men who say, oh, I feel great, top of the world, you know. Uh, and that's one way to, again, break through the training in that conventional masculinity. Uh, and remember that we have an emotional life, you know. Men are taught to repress their emotional life or uh, repress any emotion that isn't anger, right? Men are very good at expressing anger, but, um, but we're every bit as emotional creatures as women are, of course. Yes, of course. Even though we, yeah, don't allow boys and men to do, as you pointed out, we call anger not an emotion because it's yeah. the one that men are yeah. encouraged to share. Um, very practical question from Anonymous. Mm -hmm. How, for those of us who use porn regularly, can we start finding arousal from other sources? How can we yeah. retrain ourselves away from pornography when masturbating? Well, I, this is a really tough question, and I don't want to be glib about it. The only thing I know for sure, uh, and I've said this over and over, is if you're a man and you have and you're engaged in this habitual, even addictive like use of pornography, the only thing I'm pretty sure of is if you try and quit alone, you will fail because it, the, the power of it is very overwhelming. You know, the same is true of, let's say, addiction to alcohol. Right? Nobody believes that you're that the vast majority of people who are alcoholics are going to quit on their own. Everybody needs help, whether it's a 12 step group, a therapist, uh, rehab. Right? So I think the first thing is to recognize that behavioral addictions, whether it's addictions to gambling or pornography or extreme sports or whatever it is, you don't quit it alone. You have to be in a community where you have support. And as I said, there are online groups. Uh, one is called Reboot Nation. Another one is called No Fap. That's a reference to an internet term for masturbation, where men who are struggling come together. There are 12 step groups you can go to in person. Uh, some people I've talked to have had success in uh, sex addicts anonymous kinds of groups where they address their pornography use. Uh, there isn't a single, I think, route into it, uh, but I do think you have to do it with other people. And I do think that engaging a feminist analysis, whether you think of yourself as a radical feminist or not, is helpful. And reading the stories of women who are used and abused in the porn industry is helpful because it makes it real that when you're using a porn video, you're actually using another human being. And often those other human beings uh, suffered incredible psychological and physical injuries as a result. And that helps us, you know, bring it down from an abstraction into the real world, because most of us don't want to see other people hurt. That's a basic human empathy. Thank you. Great advice. Um, a similar question, and we only have time for one more, um, but I, I think this is a teacher. What advice would you have for teachers that address healthy relationships for middle school and high school students? And then another attendee asks, in this day of being censored about what we can and cannot say in the right. classroom. How do you suggest teachers address the dangers of porn use when talking to middle and high school students? Right. This is really a, a tricky question today when there's so much fear in the classroom of running afoul of, you know, pressure groups that might uh, want to constrain, especially sex education. I lived in, and spent a lot of my career in Texas where teachers had a very difficult time giving, given state law and regulations. Uh, so I, I'm not a, a great source for practical advice here. Again, what I would say is to try and in, in the classroom to try and take it out of a moral framework uh, where sex is bad, premarital sex is bad. I, I know in conservative districts, this is very hard. But, you know, what I learned from my friend Gail Dines is we have to consider this a public health question because there are public health consequences, sexual violence, harassment, all sorts of things that are directly tied to the use of pornography and can now be documented. And so that kind of shifts it away from a moral or religious question into a question of healthy living. Um, you know, uh, the way we approach all sorts of other public health problems. Uh, 
again, groups like Culture Reframed have great uh, curriculum available. Uh, and I would, this is one of the things where I'm very aware of my limitations. I would direct people to, to the experts in public education and curriculum development because they know far better than I do about how to actually raise this in the classroom without getting fired. And we will share all of those resources yeah. and links with this video. Um, I cannot believe an hour has just gone like oh. that. What a marvelous conversation, Dr. Jensen. We've I've learned so much. I love engaging yeah. with you. Thank you so much for taking the time and to impart your expertise. Well, thank you too, because um, your own work has been so important. And, and you're one of the academics I know who has really uh, made a commitment to working in the community, in the culture as well. And that's really important. And um, I always want to end by by noting the women who pioneered this analysis way back, you know, 40, 50 years ago, uh, the women who did radical feminist organizing when it was even harder than it is today. And, and Andrea Dworkin just happens to stand out in my mind, but um, I, I owe them in some ways, I owe them my life. Um, they gave me a new way to understand myself for which I will be eternally grateful. Uh, and so I'm glad my work has had some value, but it wouldn't have existed without all of those feminist mothers who who created the movement that that gave me a home. It's a great note to end on. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. And thank you all for coming. We'll see you soon. Thanks.